Um, hey there, Tom, how you doing? You're not actually on a London bus. I think no. there's a bit of ledger domain happening there. Yeah. Right? Yeah, okay. Just gonna clarify that for the record. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put our PowerPoint up on the screen. Um, so hi, everybody. Please, 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 uh, exhibition that was organized originally at the Museum of Craft and Design in San Francisco. Thank you to Joanne and her team, Joanne Edwards and her team. Also, uh, we'd like to also thank Houston Center of Contemporary Craft for their contributions to the project and the Furniture Society. And Tom, this is maybe a little lost in the midst of time, but I think we might have met through the Furniture Society originally in the late 1990s, if I'm not wrong. And obviously an organization we both had a lot to do with and a lot of love for. Um, we are going to organize our comments this evening in three sections, uh, echoing the title of the show, please, please, please. But first we wanted to start with a little bit of exposition in the form of a brief discussion of this project. So Tom, what is this? I just wanna get a word in before we dive into the folding chair. I just wanna mention a couple of things. Two yeah. things, one is that um, Katie who's managing this whole event, she's gonna put in the chat She's going to put a link to the uh, virtual tour that the Center for Art and Wood made of the exhibition. And uh, it's fantastic. I guess it's a piece of software that some of you have probably seen when you've gone to see different gallery exhibitions, but they did a really great job. And so you can actually see the installation if you take that virtual tour. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is if you, when you're on the tour, if you work your way towards the back of the gallery, there's a related exhibition that I got to curate um, and it is called Material Intelligence and the Center for Art and Wood invited me to go through their uh, collection and pick out works uh, for a related exhibition and it was super fun, super interesting. And uh, I picked a body of work that's partly from people that I know and that have been important in my career and partly people that I've never met, but all the pieces are pieces that I thought exhibited some sort of um, you know, material knowledge or something about working with the material of wood. So I encourage you to work your way to the back of the gallery and have a look at that work. Um, okay. I just want to say thanks, Tom, for, for doing that with us. This is the first time we've invited an artist to organize an exhibition based on selections from the permanent collection of the center. So um, it was really fun to work with you on this and we're thrilled to bring it to the public. Thank you. So can I lead off on this image, Glenn? Is that okay? So I was going to turn the table on Glenn a little bit. And I guess the question I, I wanted to ask is um, this piece, uh, the examples in the show, I think, are from 1987. But the design was originally done in 1981. <clears throat> and then um, the next, so that, so the next, uh, the, the exhibition then jumps 35 years forward. Uh, and so the next pieces are from the mid-teens. Um, and so there's a 35-year um, blank space. And so I wanted to sort of ask you as a curator, what was it that made you want to reach back to this piece and include it in the exhibition? And uh, was it a comment on the dearth of value in those intervening 35 years? <laughs> or or what, how, how, as, what was your thinking as a curator when you chose to include this piece? Yeah, it was, it was certainly not meant as an implicit damnation of your mid-career. Uh, production, Tom. It's um, quite the contrary, indeed. Um, I, I think maybe this will become clearer as we go through the rest of the PowerPoint, but there are certain themes of your work that I think have endured since this early moment. And as much as this is, in my mind, a kind of classic of postmodern design and studio furniture of its era, particularly in its interrogation of the relationship between art and function, which is a very you know, central preoccupation for that moment, as you know, so those who haven't seen the, the project before, the conceit of it is that you have an object that can simultaneously, or alternatively, I should say, serve as a kind of painting-like form on the wall that obviously is non-functional, a kind of neo-constructivist abstract composition, as you see on the upper right. And then through this complex and ingenious set of mechanisms can unfold into a rather sculptural, but still at least putatively functional chair. So that's a very 1981 kind of move, if I may, Tom. But it also contains these other thematic elements, among which are the idea, first of all, of interactivity. So furniture that doesn't work the way that you expect it to. And as I often like to say about your work, poses the question, if our furniture were different, would our lives be different also? And this is so radically different from a normal seating form that it poses that question. The second thing is, in fact, the 
act of questioning itself. So some element of critique or probing. In this case, as I say, really focusing on the question of art status, but there's many other kinds of inter interrogative um, qualities of your work that sort of push at the viewer's expectation, maybe destabilizes them uh, physically or metaphorically. Um, and then lastly, the idea of visual pleasure, because to, to my mind, the folding chairs have often, or have always, I suppose, delivered a lot more aesthetic punch than they really need to. Like there's a lot of things that they do in terms of color, pattern, articulation visually that are above and beyond the bare idea of a folding chair that turns into a painting. So all those things are contained in this object. And as, as I say, we'll be unfolding them all over the course of the rest of the talk. Um, before we leave the slide, Tom, you said something super interesting to me about it the other day, which is that when people look at it now, they assume that it, it was designed quite recently. And that's partly because of the technique, uh, the apparent technique, yeah. Yeah, what I was gonna say is it, I, it was kind of interesting because when you included it in the show, it made me look backwards at it and think about it. And the th looking backwards at it over 35 plus years, it's um, the way I see it has changed. It was originally designed as a response when I was just getting out of woodworking program at Boston University. One of the prompts we got from Alphonse Mattia and Jerry Osgood was to think about a production design that might help us get our launch our careers. And um, so I ended up with the idea of pulling a three dimensional form out of a flat sheet of plywood. And uh, you know, I think that idea was in the air. But I, I certainly wasn't aware at that point that there was anything called uh, CNC routing. And uh, I, don't, I don't know, you know, maybe it existed in some giant industrial scale, but it wasn't available to the sort of individual maker. And when I look at the piece now, I think anybody that looks at the image thinks, oh, see, that's, a, that's a CNC, that's a computer produced piece. And so it's sort of interesting to me the way my view of it has shifted or the context has shifted around the piece. Yeah. I think, and I think we, that we might come back to that idea about context shifting towards the end when we talk about the whole exhibition. Yeah, I might just say parenthetically that there's a whole thing there about 1980s craft anticipating later digital production, um, mm -hmm. which is fascinating, including, you know, cut and paste graphics, so-called, of that time that looked like they're made on computers. Um, and, you know, there's something video game-like also about this object that I think is really interesting and sort of true to its moment. You think about Atari and, you know, Pac-Man is sort of speaking that language in a way which just looks so great now. I don't know, it's, it's all back um, in fashion. But um, with that uh, exposition um, completed, maybe let's dive into the first of our three themes. So as you'll see, they're all organized around this idea of please or pleasing. Um, so the first is please do, and it's to do with interactivity, uh, which as we said already is part of the you know, folding chair, the idea that it invites you to fold it and, and um, unfold it. Uh, but Tom, I'm gonna um, crack through these images quite quickly now and let you sort of narrate them. Okay, so we thought, so part, so please, 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 we, you know, we were riffing on James Brown, obviously, but that was a, really a side thing. It, it really is more directly drawn from a seating program at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston that was called Please Be Seated, that was from 1974 was when it started, something like that. And the first pieces were uh, especially featured Sam Maloof, probably the most, and also Wendell Castle and some uh, George Nakashima. And the idea was to put seating in the galleries that people could actually sit on and interact with. And um, it had a really big impression on me when I would go through the museum. And the, the big museums like that, back in the 70s, they were a lot sleepier, you know, and so you could sort of poke around and explore and and it was really fun to find where these pieces had been placed in the, in the museum. The program has since expanded a lot and there's a lot of different furniture all over the place. But I really, it made a really big impression on me to be able to sit in the Maloof chairs and to have the sort of um, hand contact knowledge of sort of following his shaping. If, is there another image where I think I tried to put in a detail? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, no. okay. Um, but the, with Maloof where he has that what we would call the curvy California style. But what's so brilliant is that throughout the sort of soft organic forms, he has these incredible sort of shape sharp edges that uh, sort of bridge through the form and you could follow it. And so that anyways, that whole program made a, a really big impression on me. And I'll, usually it was like my favorite thing I would see that day when I went to the museum. 
Jonathan Fairbanks also claimed that it actually reduced the amount of touching of the other art because it's like people got that instinct out of their bodies, out of their systems, um, which was quite the contrary of what the other curators thought would happen. They thought, oh my God, people are gonna think they can touch everything. But Jonathan always claimed it was the contrary. Um, I might just say something about this object because it's so important to me personally. This is of course the planet by J.B. Blunk, which lives permanently at the Oakland Museum. And he is like, you know, a kind of saint uh, passed away a few years ago, um, but you know, lived his life in this extremely determined, obstinate, autonomous way there north of um, San Francisco and in Inverness. And uh, this is like furniture that simultaneously does Brancusi and abstraction and a jungle gym. So it's one piece of redwood, just a solid burl from a felled redwood tree. So also a kind of um, tribute to the old redwood forest that had been cut down by logging companies. And he somehow hauled it out of the ground, got it to his studio and then cut it apart um, or you know, articulated it with a chainsaw, all these different textures. And ever since, you know, now 50 years and counting, children have been able to crawl all over it and find its little crevices with their fingers and so on. So it's the ultimate piece of interactive furniture in some ways, even though it doesn't move or have any kinetic parts at all. Um, do you want to say a little bit about Nakashima, Tom? Yeah. Uh, so the Nakashima benches I would I would have seen for the first time at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and appreciated them. Um, uh, and I think, it, you know, I have to acknowledge that there's like a direct, uh, I'm drawing directly from the, his, the, the precedent of these benches for a lot of the pieces that are in the show. Um, but I, I yeah, I mean, I would also say it's not really the style of making that, um, it, but yeah, I think I'll just leave it at that for now. Mm. Um, also that idea of a kind of semi-found object that you're in intervening with. Yeah. Back. Yeah. Yes. And so this was another um, piece, um, the, um, uh, let's see, I, can you help me with the name? I guess it's, in, it, it, did you put it in the chat? I didn't, no, sorry. Um, so anyways, this is kind of a nice story. This is in 2007, I was traveling in Germany and I believe this is at, at Documenta in Kassel. Mm -hmm. And um, for some reason we ended up in the back room, uh, in the back area, you can tell we're not really in public space at this point. And this piece was um, being uh, stored in that space. In fact, it was partially disassembled. Mm -hmm. And I had seen this piece in magazines. It got quite a bit of publication publication in various design publications. This image looks funny because it's actually a book that I photographed, a book I believe. But anyways, it was one of those sort of magic furniture world moments where I was just wandering through the museum and I came upon this object that I knew uh, that I'd seen and admired before. And it was just really neat. It wasn't really officially on display, but I think it has that same sort of um, invitation that fits inside that sort of please, 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 and, and that same thing, which I'm always interested in, which is that uh, it offers really unusual and, and interesting ways for people to organize themselves. Yeah, I hadn't actually seen this before Tom just showed it to me, um, but to me it also suggests a kind of breaking down between furniture and landscape, more landscape actually than architecture. It seems like it kind of blows out into space in a way that um, some of the pieces in Please, Please, Please do also this kind of uh, explicit um, engagement with context as well as with the body, which is of course maybe more what we associate with uh, furniture. Um, and here's a uh, here's an installation of uh, what you might call public artworks, public I just, furniture. I just want to credit those two makers. It's Ivan Failing and Jenny Peitz, and it's in German. In my bad German, it's called Stuhlhockerbank, which means chair, stool, bench. All three words sort of mushed together. Ah, okay. Nice. So here we are in Madison, Germany to Madison in one short step. You want me to lead off? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so um, these this Stoop project is uh, was a collaborative project that I did with my wife, Bird Ross, who's sitting there looking at reading the New York Times. And um, the I, and so again, it's this, it's this idea about an, an invitation, a public invitation and the idea about public space and private space. And just uh, the thinking about stoops as this very sort of interesting kind of um, in-between space between the, the public and the private. 
And a stoop is, uh, it's about, as you, a stoop is a little bit of a venture into public space, but your private space is right behind you. Mm -hmm. And so it's this sort of in, in between, uh, very nice sort of space. And then I, I think um, the, the, um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, one of the things that's nice about doing an exhibition like that is smart people like Glenn think about your work and write about it. And Glenn had mentioned the idea that um, uh, one of the things I'm interested in is creating situations. As much as objects, I'm interested in creating situations. And I think this is a reasonable example of that. Um, I was talking to Bert earlier today and she said, um, it's, it's really, um, <clears throat> that, it, that stoops are really a very personal space and that it's almost, when you sit on a stoop with someone, it's almost like you're sharing a picnic blanket. Oh, that's beautiful. That's kind of a nice, a nice image. Yeah, it's, it, I think, always think of a stoop also as this kind of liminal structure between the street and the house and, you know, architecture and its surroundings. It's this sort of, uh, it's like a social airlock, you know, and you can imagine somebody that's a stranger coming to your stoop or somebody that's a friend coming to your stoop, stoop and it's where those, relationships kind of get defined. And so then to transplant that typology into a uh, different space and having them floating as these autonomous forms is quite an interesting move because it it's almost like you're placing that whole complex set of possibilities out into a gallery and inviting people to redefine their relationships with one another without the existing, you know, um, dynamics of, you know, the month before the election in a swing state when people are coming to knock on your door, all those things that we associate with the stoop now. Um, and you're sort of cutting, cutting them free and letting them roam into the uh, free space of the gallery for people to redefine the form. Um, and you can see how enjoyable that is here. Um, I love that, Tom, that you so often photograph your work with people actually interacting with it. It's actually, if you think about it, quite unusual in the mediatization of furniture that we see it not as pure sculptural object, but as something that people are actually hanging out on. And that's something you tend to do a lot, I've noticed. Um, so let's um, now move over to our next, um, next section, which we called, Oh Please. Uh, this is meant to be, uh, you know, <laughs> pronounced satirically. So here we're thinking about critique and the idea of skepticism or interrogation, as I was saying earlier. So the idea that furniture could be a kind of social tool of analysis. And we thought we would start with Maestro Enzo Mari, rest in peace. He just passed away of COVID actually, as did his wife, Leah Virginie, um, at the end of 2020. And I've just actually written a long piece um, sort of inspired by him, uh, which just came out in The Nation this week, which I'll put in the chat at the end if people want to read it. Uh, which is about the question of why Enzo Mari's work looks kind of like Ikea, uh, because Mari was, of course, an intense communist and very critical of the um, system of capitalistic profit-driven consum consumption and production. And Ikea, obviously, is the opposite. It's sort of the ultimate capitalist, capitalist domestic brand in a way. And yet they both were subscribing to these kind of modernist ideas of efficiency and uh, rationality, which is fascinating to consider. And so that's what I tried to do in that piece. But this particular project is called Autoprojezione, which means something like self-project. And the idea was that Mari put out the plans for these pieces of furniture into the world and encouraged people to make them themselves with whatever materials they could get at their local DIY store, essentially, the Italian version of a DIY store. So the idea was to invite them to circumvent as much as possible the production of commodities by furniture companies, despite the fact that he's a professional designer who also works for furniture companies. So he's sort of probing the contradictions between his own ideology and his professional identity in this undertaking. And so that's the, the kind of quick story on Enzo Mari. Uh, Tom, did you uh, want to add anything? Yeah, to is there one more picture? Is that the last Enzo Mari picture? There's one more, yeah. yeah. Okay, so go back to the one before. Yeah. Uh, so for Glenn, this section is the sort of critique um, section. But I, I think what I, what I, well, a couple of things. One is, uh, I think Katie put the link for the 
uh, Glenn's piece in The Nation, it's really fabulous. And Glenn didn't say that it's actually the cover story on the latest issue of The Nation. It's really good. And at the end, he also sort of brings it all forward and talks about the current um, situation in the art and design world. Um, and you get to read a couple articles free in The Nation without subscribing. So check it out. <laughs> and then the other thing, um, so this is Enzo Mari putting it together. And, you know, I see this as an incredibly sort of optimistic um, design project. Um, and, and, you know, anytime that somebody um, sets themselves up as, as the carpenter and, and, ma and makes the furniture for themselves, that's an incredibly optimistic mm -hmm. act. And um, the, I think, you know, any um, anytime that you, um, that you, um, Hang on just a sec. So yeah, I think it's the 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 the, the whole idea um, that grabbing a tool is an optimistic act, and um, in in yeah, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. I, I see it as it's obviously a critique of capitalism, but it offers a, a solution in such a nice way. Yeah, I suppose also the we might say that any any example of radical design or critical design worth its salt implies a kind of optimism because if it were not optimistic what would be the point of making the critique unless it were some kind of nihilistic you know gesture of futility which also happened like Alessandro Mendini would be a good example of that in the 1970s so there is that kind of darker side of postmodern or radical design but I think most of it is actually very optimistic much more so than capitalism actually because capitalism doesn't make that great utopian leap into the assumption that everything could be different capitalism is usually driven by short-term return on investment, right? So it's possibly optimistic, but only in a highly rationalized and systematized way. Whereas what someone like Enzo Mari is doing is a much greater expression of confidence in the possibility that humans could reinvent themselves or that there might be some other fundamental way of relating to one another. Um, and of course, this has a history. So as I talked about in the, in the Nation article, it um, very much is rooted in the utopianism of the early 20th century. So here we're seeing, of course, the great Gerd Riedfeld. That's my best version of that pronunciation. Um, the Dutch designer. Uh, so you see him there. And um, this, of course, is um, an array of his works, some of which you'll recognize, like the zigzag chair there on the upper left. And I know that Riedfeld has been particularly important for you as a source, um, Tom. So I would love to hear you talk about him a little bit. Yeah, well, I I think the reason I wanted that. Why, why don't you go to the why don't you go to the red blue chair? Okay. So this has been like a really I, important object for me over the years that I just keep going back to. It's you know it's pretty simple. You see it almost every time you go to a museum with a design collection, and um, it's it's interesting. I believe that I read at some point when I was reading about this piece that part of his intent was also that all the dimensions of these parts are the sizes that you could buy. In a um, in a Dutch uh, lumber yard, so that you could, in theory, go buy all the parts, cut them, and put it together. The joinery is very simple. But um, what what I like about this piece, if if in the in the image where he's sitting outside the shop on smoking break, I believe he's sitting in an unpainted version of er, version of the chair. It's also got little side wings. There's many many versions of the chair, but he was adopted into the De Style group. And the iconic version is this one that we know. And I think that one way of looking at it is um, if you were to start with the goal of supporting a body in space and work from that body in space down to the ground, this chair is offering you what you need to support that body in space. So you start with a blue plywood plane for your butt and a red plane for your back. <clears throat> and then all of the black structure is what you need and nothing extra to hold those two planes in the correct orientation in space. So they're almost like a scaffolding and it looks a little complicated, but if you go through each piece, there's actually nothing you can eliminate. Uh, so it's a very economical essay on supporting a body in space. And yeah. um, I, I think that idea of sort of uh, direct clean solutions to problems is maybe a theme through our presentation. I think you see it in Enzo Mari, you're gonna see it in some other things that are coming up. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously one definition of good design and one that was very much at the heart of modernism. I will say it's one that you often um, deflect from because there's a lot of features of your work that actually aren't just strictly necessary according to some logical imposition. 
but we'll get to that in a second. I just wanted to say one other thing about the red blue chair at the risk of engaging in an hour long symposium on this one object because you certainly could. But um, this, the other way that I always think about it is that you can imagine those black lines it is, you know, and you're absolutely right, Tom, to say that they're the bare necessity to hold up the chair such as it is conceived. But you can also imagine them extending in space infinitely and that this chair is one section, a three-dimensional section of an infinite grid, which is a very important idea in De Stijl. It also comes up in Mondrian's paintings. If you think about, for example, his diamond paintings, where the black lines are interrupted, the idea is that the painting could expand, you know, without interruption in every direction. And of course, that is itself a utopian gesture because it has this idea of the world being remade. So there's a wonderful combination here of utilitarianism and again, that radical expansionist idealism that we associate with the modern utopian project. And the fact that the chair does both of those things at once and has that Janus face quality, I think is one of the reasons that it's become such an enduring classic. Even if you don't necessarily consciously realize all of that or you know, have all of that background in your head, I think sometimes how you feel it and the rigor and intensity of the object has to do with that kind of tension or dialectical contradiction. Um, so this maybe brings us to your, um, your New York, Chicago, Los Angeles project. And it might just be worth starting by talking about that title and the logic behind it and the idea of the furniture. And then maybe we can get into the degree to which it's critical or not once you've explained that. Where, 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 where did Shell Silverstein go? Is he coming up later? He's coming up, don't oh, worry. Okay. All right, okay. So uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, sort of basics. And, um, and so this came, you know, a little bit from thinking about what, you know, what is the most basic form of seating? And maybe it's a tree stump or maybe it's a rock. Um, and does it need to be anything else than just this very uh, simple sort of block? And then it borrows the geometry of a yoga block. So it can be in a sort of, maybe go to another image or keep going. There's that one uh, with the, um, anyway, so you get the idea. And um, so it, it, what ha it turns out that this is a format that's used in photographer's studios um, when they're doing group shots and they need to adjust people's height. And um, I learned that later um, from a photographer friend and they use a terminology, set it up LA, which means flat, or set it up Chicago, or set it up New York. And I actually don't know, you know, I guess Chicago is probably the middle one and New York the tall one. I'm not quite sure why, but that, that's the way it is. And then, so it gives you this sort of range of seating, but it's this ultra basic thing. And so the, I think, you know, the role that these pieces are playing in the exhibition are that invitation to interact. And if you go back to the first image, um, so that we've incorporated, it's always an issue with furniture in the, in the public exhibition space is furniture is meant to be interacted with, but you can't really. And so Glenn came up with the idea of making these plywood ones, which are interactable and the, on top of a carpeted surface. So you can go in there and configure it how you want, uh, give yourself the height you want, and also configure the, if you're with a group of people. And um, so that's that interest of mine again. And I guess sort of this movement that maybe towards more and more sort of flexibility, like furniture that's less prescribing how you sit and more sort of open-ended. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of things I wanted to just touch on here briefly. One is the interesting recall, which was actually not intentional when I came up with the idea of doing the interactive plywood ones. I just thought that would be better for kids, frankly, because they would enjoy it. But then it occurred to me when seeing the installation, like we see here, that there's a funny return to the dynamics of the folding chair because you have the object idea expressed as something on a platform to look at and then you also have it expressed as something you can interact with and so it's not quite as didactic if i can put it that way as the folding chair but you still have that idea of the same idea being um, realized in two different states one of which is more art-like and the other one of which is more utilitarian and it again shows the kind of arbitrariness of that division in some ways that you know, it's only because the Center for Art and Wood is telling you don't sit on one and do sit on the other that they function differently. Um, the other thing that might be worth saying here is that I think I do think of your work as related to critical design and very informed by it. We've already talked about Mari Rietfeld. We could talk about Gaetano Pache. 
uh, Satsat, other, other designers of that tradition. Um, but I guess what I would say is that it's a kind of gentle form of criticism, like a kind of leading and intriguing kind of criticism that tugs you towards the domain of other possibilities rather than the radical direct sort of driving right through the plate glass window methodology of Enzo Mari or to some extent Riedfeld. And one of the things that I think cues you to that difference is the fact that you give more than is necessary as we said, which is kind of a good um, segue. We're just seeing here a couple of uh, processions, uh -huh. by the way, this is your wonderful upholsterer. We so this is Matthew Nefrenowitz of the straight thread, who's an absolute genius upholsterer. And so when it came to him with these fairly simple cubes, he would tell me how to construct the damn thing so that he could upholster it correctly. And it's incredibly complicated underneath <laughs> the surface. And so I just thought people might get a kick out of seeing that. And he cut the, the, the cow hides and dyed the cow hides six different colors. And um, so anyways, I just wanted to sort of honor his, his skill and his sort of him directing me how to do the woodworking that he needed in order to make the simple looking upholstered pieces. And say his name again, just so people get Matthew the Matthew Nefranowitz, the Nefranowitz. straight thread. Yeah. Um, but what I was leading to is that I think that in Tom's work, what you get is that gentle criticism with a tremendous overlay of visual pleasure. And so this is where we get Shel Silverstein because I was, really taken by the idea that Tom's work has a heart that's similar to the kinds of ideas that are, are present in this wonderful book. And I don't know if people know this book, but if not, do yourself a favor and read it. It'll only take you 10 minutes. It'll stay with you the rest of your life. And I don't want to ruin it by giving too much away if you haven't read it. And if you have read it, there's no way I can do it justice anyway. But basically the plot is that this tree spends its entire life giving this child everything that he needs and wants as he grows older. And the child eventually goes off, of course, grows up, leaves and abandons the tree and finally comes back and sits on the tree when it's been reduced to a stump because it's given everything of itself to the child. And it, as you can see, it says, and the tree was happy. And I, I love the idea that's present in this book that the furniture would be pleased by us using it or somehow gratified or it's, you know, Aristotelian telos, like its goal, its existential goal in existence would be somehow met by our use of it. And that the pleasure could be two way, which is a really fascinating idea. Like this idea of ob people are talking these days about object oriented ontology and, you know, objects that with agency, a lot of fancy theoretical ideas, but the basic idea being that the object looks back at us and it, we should think about how it feels, even if that's only a, an imaginative process that might encourage us to interact with our environment in a more holistic and healthy way. Um, but I feel like it's a great way of thinking about Scott Burton, basically is what it comes down to. And this idea that these objects, which might feel like radical design, could instead be thought of as being deeply about pleasure. So I wanted to pose that as a possibility to you, Tom, in putting the, the, these objects in this section of the, of the... Yeah, so Scott Burton was really important to me when I was first starting to think about furniture and I was living in Boston and I would travel down to New York and go through galleries and museums and stumble on his, um, his work, that, which was incorporated into the um, fine art galleries. And it was really the only person who was kind of thinking about furniture at that level and getting, getting into those situations. And he died in 1989. And um, I think that the work would be fresh if it was made for the first time this morning. And um, I think that's really important. I think um, he's been a little bit out of the dialogue or else I just haven't been looking in the right places. But obviously here's the seat that's a rock. Um, it doesn't need to be any more than that, a rock and two slices and um, uh, maybe go, on, go to the next image. And you know, there's a, there's a sort of a structural smartness and a cleanness and a, and a simplicity um, that I, I find uh, extremely appealing in the work. Yeah, I always think he's like the best parts of Donald Judd and Osama Noguchi fused into one person, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's good. As far as furniture goes. Yeah. Um, 
and here's a relatively little known project of his in wood, which quotes the Appalachian, not, not the Adirondacks chair, sorry, Adirondacks yeah, chair. And in the back, in the middle image in the back is a really, another really beautiful wooden chair. But so there's like a cleanness and a clarity and a sort of a vision of what he's trying to do perfectly executed. Yeah, but it's very interesting that he's, um, and this is something I would also associate with like Noguchi's work with Martha Graham as a set designer. Mm. Um, he's also open to vernacular quotation and sources and basically furniture as you actually experience it in real life. Because when you first see this, you think, okay, this is minimalism. It's almost like a piece of conceptual art, like how little can you do and get a chair out of, out of it? And that the same person would do this, I think is extremely interesting and indicative. And it shows you that he's, again, interested in humor and gratification and curiosity and not just demonstration and analysis, which is what you might take away from the rock pieces. So that's why I think it's maybe counterintuitive, but I think from my point of view, totally right to put him in this third section, which is about visual pleasure. Um, but I would say that's also a very, very strong aspect of the project that we did together. And maybe the core of it is this idea that the furniture gives to you in a way that a great theatrical production might or a film or fine art like photography and uh, painting might um, or of course sculpture which many of the pieces resemble and a big part of that is your use of these um, kind of flat art techniques like uh, cyanotypes um, and as we'll see these these pyrographs uh, that sort of riff on the imagery that we see elsewhere in the show in three dimensions and I wonder Tom if you could just talk a little bit about these this sort of turn to two-dimensionality in your work. Yeah. So um, these, uh, there's a set of cyanotypes and then there's a set of pyrographs which are burned imagery. And they were both done at residencies and the cyan they both started at Anderson Ranch. The cyanotypes were all done at Anderson Ranch and um, in Colorado. And then the pyrographs were started at Anderson Ranch but really completed during another residency at the Ragdale Foundation in Lake Forest, Illinois. And um, I guess for me, um, I, what I especially liked, or this I have this sort of ongoing battle with the kind of uh, slowness and fussiness of furniture. And so I have, I'm really attracted to um, things that are immediate. And that's one of the reasons I like collaborating with my wife is when we make a piece together, it happens like seven times faster than if I make it by myself, because um, she's smarter about that stuff. But um, with these, it's a little bit like, um, the image creation is a little bit like clicking the shutter on a camera, but maybe a little more hardcore be, with no access to any darkroom post-production and no access to Photoshop. In other words, what you, what you do in the actual situation is what you get. Um, and so with the pyrographs, what, what's the next image, Glenn? Actually, I think we're gonna talk about tools for a second. So let's oh. talk about the subject matter and we'll get back to the pyrographs in a oh, second. Okay. Okay. Well, so the tools, I think, I won't say anymore, just in the interest of keeping going, this, this is in my shop. The last thing I did in my shop was organize my inventory of tools, which I've been collecting since 1991. But um, I think the tools, we kind of covered it, or I, I said what I wanted to say when I talked about the optimism of a tool and, and grabbing, grabbing a tool. There's and, also something beautiful that you said about um, the particularity of being in Wisconsin when it comes to snow shovels and the like, and this idea of like tools that are only seen you know, half buried in snow banks, which I can identify with at the moment because we've had a lot that of- was just, When we first moved here in 91, I mean, people probably still do it at the end of winter. It's a celebration to show out, throw out your beat up shovel. And back in 91, they looked like this. They were really beautiful. Now they're all plastic and not so nice. But that's when I started collecting them. I, I just pulled, started pulling them out of people's garbage cans. And here, obviously, we see the Nakashima reference very strongly that we foreshadowed earlier. Um, there's also this unbelievably beautiful object scythe by scythe, which, gosh, I mean, this really needs, it, this is not in a museum collection, is it, Tom? No. Well, curators out there, you've been told, you have no excuse, because it should be acquired somewhere. It's I could maybe say something quickly at this point that the way these happened is, um, uh, I was invited to participate in a, a pro, an art project that involved working with ash trees that were being cut down, I guess all over the country at this point because of the emerald ash borer. And that was really sort of my reintroduction to the notion of a live edge slab. It's not a way I had worked at all. I knew it from the Nakashima bench, which we talked about before, 
But so I started working with the, uh, the ash and it introduced me to a, a couple of places in Madison that were using urban trees and doing this whole vertically integrated thing where they would go in somebody's backyard, cut down an urban tree and mill a tree that wouldn't typically previously have usually been milled because of the access to bandsaw mills and other things that can deal with this kind of wood. And then they're selling the slab, they're actually kiln drying the slabs, selling the slabs and also making them into their own furniture. But I really liked it. It's got a good, as far as I can tell, it's got a good ecological pedigree. And, and so I liked it and I ended up making these benches which are really quite different from the, mostly what I was previously known for. Mm. Right. And, you know, th there's, again, this idea that the tool is in the eye of the beholder, because here you've turned it into this alternative functional form, the backrest. But to me, when we go to the um, way that you're working with cyanotypes and pyrographs, the result is this funny reversal where the chair form, for example, becomes a tool and you're yeah. making a tool as a way of making the image. Um, so th this is actually how... This is how the oh, site. You know, this is at Emerson Ranch. This is how I made the shadow, you know, did the cyanotypes. That paper is treated with the chemicals. And I was doing about a 12 minute exposure. It's kind of interesting at Anderson Ranch because you actually only get direct sunlight for about four or five hours a day in November, December, as it, because otherwise it's behind some mountain range. And um, so it's kind of fun. And you need a lot of big sinks. And so I was working in their printmaking studio. And um, these would be 12 minute exposures. And so one of the things I was interested in is also the way it, uh, documents the passage of time because the sun moves in 12 minutes and so you get those interesting blurs and and the and the light also has this uh, um, constant seeking of getting around a three-dimensional object so the only place that really stays white is the part that's in direct contact with the paper everything else has some sort of variate some sort of level of shading yeah it's also interesting that you're um, using this primordial photographic process you know going way back to the days of excuse me, Fox Talbot, the uh, invention of photography and using this kind of platonic chair form that, you know, is like your cartoon idea of, of like pre-chair before you even get to the question of how you'd build one. Um, <laughs> so here we see some of the results. The stump of chairs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's what you get when you make that sort of pile of chairs and let the sun sort of work its way around it. And then we have the pyrographs. So the pyrographs are the same in that, um, so go one more. So in, in lower, oh, there you can see, a, so in the up there, so I just did about 50 of these kind of chair forms, very, um, you know, basic chair forms in different sizes and made them into brands and heated them with a torch. And I was working in outside Chicago. It was like super cold. It was like the spell we just had over the last couple of weeks. And I was working primarily at night because I could tell about what the temperature was on the, on the metal the best of all. And so there's this incredible sort of immediacy. There's like no erasing um, and what, what you get is what you get. So this one's kind of interesting because what I was playing around with was actually leaving the brand on. So I was onto heavyweight watercolor paper, but if you leave the brand, hot brand on long enough, it just vaporizes the paper and makes it disappear. So some of those chair profiles are holes in the paper. Um, just from leaving it on there. So, is there, so it's the game of placing it with no chance to reposition it and then deciding how long to leave it. So it's a little bit like uh, the art version of making a s'more at the campfire. <laughs> I like that. Um, okay, and then we're just gonna conclude with one last allusion to the um, possibilities of dysfunctionality. Um, so th this is another uh, super interesting reference that. Tom, you wanted to pull in, so can you yeah, talk about so this? Is, this uh, is an artist named Nina Saunders. Um, and I saw these, uh, I think mostly at the Tate in, in London. And um, they, she makes this um, sort of aesthetically appealing, very inviting upholstery that's actually sort of cancerous and dysfunctional. And I just thought that was a, it's a, just a powerful image. And she has some other pieces that are um, equally um, compelling. And um, so I, an idea of disruption leading to another kind of beauty. It reminds me of, you know, like radical fashion design, like Comme des Garçons, you know, Ray Kawakubo and Comme des Garçons. Yeah. Kind of maneuver. Um, yeah. But it would be interesting to relate it to these pieces, uh, which are actually not in the Please, Please, Please show, but have been shown previously at the Center for Art and Wood. 
um, which are based on boat forms, but are obviously not functional boat shapes. You want me to talk about them? Yeah, yeah go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, well, so I think, you know, the, the I really think everything that I make um, is related to function and um, gets its meaning, meaning from function. But this whole series came from really sort of developing bad ideas for boats and <laughs> boats ha have and so in a way you know, that was the connection that i thought would you know it would connect interestingly to that upholstered piece but um a boat is such a strict functional object and such a symmet basically symmetrical object that starting to play with asymmetricality and also notions of movement and how things move through water and that's where the these various flotilla forms all came from either thinking about movement through water or um, yeah, 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 just sort of di dysfunctional versions of function that aren't worth a damn unless you think about how they relate to function. Yeah, and the last thing I wanna say is that it's, you know, since we're talking about pleasure and aesthetics here, ultimately, I think it's really important to say that at least from my point of view, Tom achieves that in lots of different ways simultaneously. So it's not like there's one position that you're taking where you're saying, well, conventional furniture does this for you and I'm gonna give you this other thing. It's like you give us what furniture often gives us at its best. And you also kind of tap dance around the form and into these other areas like boat building, um, tool making, photography, et cetera. And there's this tremendous kind of flexibility and open-mindedness in your practice, which I think is really, really um, moving in a funny way, even though it's quite humble and sort of low key and uh, charming might be a good word for it uh, and inviting. You know, there's, there's never any quality of um, kind of, uh, you know, my way or the highway heroism <laughs> or, you know, kind of didacticism or authority it's it's quite the contrary it's a very sort of um very sort of open practice and so that's despite the fact that you're you're not engaging in that kind of modern utopianism i think there's also a way in which you're pointing to a sense of infinite possibility um in a way that's quite humane and i think quite valuable and also very much in the spirit of the center for art and wood because i think that's really the spirit of the institution since albert founded it and now under nava's leadership i think it's always retained that ethic. So I'm obviously beyond pleased that it's come to um, your wonderful galleries, Nava. Um, by the way, it's something like 2.30 in the morning for Nava, so uh, <laughs> she deserves special credit and thanks for staying. This is, what, this is what it looks like in my backyard this afternoon. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I think we had talked about one other thing, Glenn, which is that uh, we, I had talked about the folding chair earlier and how time has sort of shifted the context, but it's true with this exhibition too, because it started in San Francisco a couple of years ago and it's been, this is its fourth venue actually. Yeah. And um, of course there's been this huge change in the world. And we talked about that a little bit yesterday and today when we were getting ready and just the idea that, um, you know, the show was curated in one way two years ago and we and the world has changed and it and it makes the show look different and do you want to speak to that well yeah you know even if you think about those images of the people gathered on the stoops in the installation in madison how poignant and even also mm -hmm. in a funny way shocking it's like when you see a movie now and there are people just talking to one another in a bar and you're like what that, you can't do that you know because oh it's, it was shot in 1972 and so you know the 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 obviously the degree to which our lives have been upended uh, does not need to be underlined. But I do think there's something in the show that feels poignant because of that, like the kind of weird innocence of it, just having been generated in pre-COVID time, and that it maybe gives us something to aspire to getting back to, where that where we could have a sort of relaxed relationship with furniture-like objects again. Um, instead of having to worry that we might get sick from them if we touch them without gloves, you know? I, so there, there's something kind of deep there that I haven't necessarily worked out. Um, and obviously it would be great for me to get down to Philadelphia if I get vaccinated and see the show again too. Um, but, uh, and I hope people can, can get in to see it, um, or at least as Tom said, take the virtual tour. Uh, but I think we probably should leave it there. And questions, please.
any questions. I think Nava uh, is going to help us through the question. And answer. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help us navigate that. Go ahead, Tom. You wanna end the screen share? Yeah. There we go. Um, thank you both. This has been so much fun and such a race. Um, we, we, we touched on so many things and I know I have a lot of questions, but first I'm going to defer to um, our chat here. And um, Dominique has a question. First of all, what are the moments over the years that you've been surprised by how your furniture has been interacted with? Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, one of our really, well, it's, I think it's the way kids interact with furniture. And, uh, and I've done, one of the things I've done a bunch of is public seating in museums and especially at the um, Madison uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, and um, those stoops that you saw were actually done for there. But I've done, I think I've done three or four different versions of public seating. And kids go wild on interactive furniture. And I learned that really quickly. And we have a friend who is the director of exhibitions at the Madison Children's Museum. And she said, you have to think of kids like water. They'll move the way, they'll move through and around objects the way that water does. And you have to, um, you have to channel the water. That's brilliant. I wanted to add as, as someone who has lived for several years off and on or many, many times is kind of a prodigal daughter to the city of New York. The stoop is definitely the locus of, um, of a lot of social and communal and city engagement. And definitely in times of disaster, that's where community happens is on the stoops, whether it was the blackout of 2002 or 2003, I think it was, or September 11th. Um, and so that provides a really loaded but also very poignant gathering space. Um, for talking about community in, for, in terms of furniture. Makes me think about Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing too, the way he uses the stoop as a location for community and it's all of its contradictions and tensions and joys. And angles too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's see, Suzanne has a question <laughs> connected to your comment about tools and optimism, which I think we could, we could dedicate a whole conversation to that. Um, uh, so Suzanne's question is what tool have you, what is the tool that you have not yet used, but you might pick up today to express optimism specifically? Ooh, that's an awesome question. <laughs> Maybe you've used all the tools, that's the problem. <laughs> there are more tools? It might be, I don't know, we might be inventing some new tools. I'm not sure. Mm. Um, that's interesting. Oh, I'm not going to do well with this question off the top of my head. But I think about some, I think some tools are, you know, some, I, I guess my mind immediately goes to things like um, two person tools, you know, there's some saws and things that are used by two people. There's, um, I, you know, I've seen these sort of, well, it happens when the, in the milling process with chainsaws and stuff, but I've also seen sort of the traditional version with pit sawing in some Central American countries and there's this is sort of, I don't know, I think, I think maybe we may be looking to tools that connect people. Although it is, might be worth saying, Tom, that um, of course pit sawing was how saws, how logs were sawn in European and American yeah. context before the uh, development of sawmills too. And the person who was at the bottom of the pit sawing team was very much um, at the lower station and person it's on the top. Raw deal. You yeah, can't absolutely. The sawdust all lands on your head. Absolutely. So it, it's it's a really fascinating thing because it sort of captures the social fabric in miniature. It's like connection, but also hierarchy. We don't seem to be able to have the one without the other. So there's there's a nice essay there for somebody to write, maybe. I think I don't know. I mean, I'm just sort of re freelancing, but I think maybe for a lot of people, tool kitchen tools have become more yeah. important in terms of getting through the pandemic. And mm -hmm. I mean, we're, Bird and I aren't really foodies. But we're spending a lot more time eating nice meals at home and enjoying the, yeah. There's also, of course, um, new digital tools, which have made people optimistic in sometimes perhaps overambitious ways. But the idea that 3D printing and all of its developments like rapid liquid printing and so on um, could totally revolutionize the way that we interact with our environment. Because, you know, you print something 
and when you're done with it, you throw it back in the hopper and you print it into a different form, that kind of idea. So this sort of Star Trekization of our material environment. And you hear people talking about, you know, 3D printers doing for the material world what 2D printers did for desktop publishing. So whether that will happen, I don't know if that's an optimistic or a pessimistic forecast, but it's definitely something people have talked about with respect to those tools. Definitely. Um, so Sam, who is um, on the center staff, um, he's uh, in visitor engagement and also um, does, all, does most of the work of um, social media. Um, he is asking um, how, this is a tough question actually, if you were in his place, greeting, responsible for greeting people as they arrive at the center and encapsulating the exhibition in just a few words, how would you briefly describe please, please, please? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a set of um, situations to bar borrow Glenn, Glenn's term. It's a set of situations that you, because it's a, you know, it's an, ex an exhibition space and it's not fully interactive. Mm -hmm. It's a set of situations that you interact with um, mentally and con conceptually, but it, it's pretty understandable. It, I think that's one of the things I've always liked about furniture is it's pretty darn accessible. Everybody knows what, it, what a thing looks like that you're supposed to sit on. And so it's a set of situations that you explore visually, but also engage with mentally and think through its possibilities. Yeah, I like the idea of saying, oh, it's quite self-explanatory at the beginning. But I just wanted to say, um, and I always feel this about docents too, but also visitor uh, engagement staff, that um, you know, curators often make the terrible mistake of having a lofty disregard for those people because they're not on the professional, I don't know, ladder of something that they think is important. But I always think that curators learn way more from visitor engagement staff than the other way around, because you actually get to find out what people really think of your show. And it sort of gets you out of that bubble that you can be in. So I kind of really want to hear what Sam will say to that question in like three months, <laughs> you know, after having seen so many people interacting with the project, he'll be the real expert, not us. Yeah, well, Sam also is a recent graduate of Tyler, School of Art History at um, Temple University. So he's, um, he's definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, do we have a time for a couple more? Tom and Glenn, okay. Um, Patricia is asking, um, let's see, to be able to look at a bench and not have my first thought be, is it long enough so that I will be six feet from another if I could sit on it? Well, this is a COVID uh, related question, definitely. I mean, that's what we were talking about, exactly that, so well put. Mm -hmm. I think to be fair, there are some benches in the, in the show that are six feet long at least. <laughs> So I, I, I haven't seen the, um, you know, the COVID um, killer piece of furniture. I mean, I shouldn't say killer. That's the wrong term. I haven't seen the piece of furniture that aces the function, the needed COVID functionality. I haven't seen it yet. Mm. I mean, you know, there's interesting jury rigged things, but I don't think the best thinking has been done yet. Mm. Actually, you know, it's, there's an interesting subtopic there about jury rigged material culture because suddenly we're facing a lot of it out there. And it's, a, it's like a golden age for the improvised solution. Everything from tape on the floor to plastic shields and so on, obviously in a terrible situation. But you know, the, um, the, the kind of improvisatory creativity of let's say Brazilian street culture has been so celebrated, but now you're actually seeing it all over the globe in a very fascinating way. So um, it'll be interesting to see if we have a kind of weird nostalgia or fascination with that after this is all over. It doesn't just seem like a matter of life and death is what we're facing now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Peter Park is asking, how much of your work was influenced by the fact that you are an educator um, for so uh, many years in your career? And do you feel that it's connected or not? And I actually have a sub question that goes along with that. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I would have a two-part answer. Maybe, maybe I'll mention three things. I mean, one is the students keep, keep you sharp. Like I would have gone gray in the brain a long time ago if I wasn't interacting with all the smart students. Um, so that's one thing. And it's really cool. You know, it's really, I'm really honored to see some of my favorite grad students I've worked with over the years in the little Zoom windows. But um, the other thing I was going to say is that in some ways being an educator 
because it's fairly time consuming. It, uh, in a way I was spoiled, but um, it made me uh, in the time that I did have to make things, uh, make whatever I wanted. So in other words, being an educator left me free in my non-education time to do whatever I wanted in the studio. I didn't, I don't actually do a lot of commissions. Uh, I just sort of make, my path has been more to make stuff and look for exhibition situations for it. Um, yeah. What's, the, what's your sub question, Nava? Um, well, I think a lot of your work aligns with, with questions that were circulating and have been circulating in the contemporary design world. And, and Glenn mentioned um, critical design of the 21st century. Um, and it's very, I think your body of work is very firmly situated in that discourse, but, um, but you uniquely are a maker as well. Um, and your, your work is adhering to several kinds of um, uh, 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 sort of makership uh, concerns. And, um, and that is not necessarily part of a design oriented discourse, at least in the 21st century. So how, how, um, how has that kind of influenced the work that you're doing or the way that you address those, those concerns about functionality and interaction and behaviors? Um, in relationship with seating and, and yeah. design? Well, I one way to answer that is to say, I'm super jealous of designers who can do a drawing and then hand it off to the factory to get produced because I cannot do that at all. And in, in fact, one of the things that happens when you teach at a research university is you get to have people, you get in support of students, you get to have students work with you on projects. And I'm even terrible at having students work with me on projects because I am like totally, having to figure it out myself. And so it's just, a, it's a different way of working. I'm, I'm, I, I'm built to be a single person working in a, in a one person shop. That's when I'm the most comfortable. Um, that's just the way my making process works. Thank you. That's a beautifully concise answer to what could have been a very complicated <laughs> discussion. <laughs> we'll save that for next time, but um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. This has been an extremely nutritious evening. And, um, and I, I want to thank um, Tom and Glenn for putting this together for us. And I, and I, I especially appreciate the fact that you did um, a bit of preparation um, to bring this to the center's audience. So that's, that's an enormous honor. Um, I also want to thank the University of the Arts um, Craft and Material Studies program, who, who um, also uh, co-presented this program with us tonight. And we could not be more pleased. And, um, and please, please, please continue to meet with us. Um, yeah, Tom, you had a question. I wanted to say one thing. You know, I wanted to recognize the role that Glenn is playing in the field. You know, that, I'm, that there's, there's been, when you look at the field today, there's a number of smart people that write about the field. But if you go back, not very far, I don't know, you know, 15, 18 years, it didn't really exist that there were like smart, good writers that are um, kind and interactive, socially adept people that were writing about the field. And it's a real, it's a huge transformation that we have this sort of good writing and this uh, high level conversation. And Glenn has been, you know, at the very peak of making that transformation happen. And we should be, we should appreciate that. So. That's awesome. That's Chapeau. Nice. Chapeau to you both. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, keep, keep sticking with the center as we um, continue to talk about, please, please, please. Um, the exhibition will continue in the center's gallery until the end of July. And um, Tom and Glenn, you both hopefully you'll both check in with us um, in the next few months. It's been so, so fun to have you with us today, and um, and thanks everyone. Um, keep keep uh, in touch with the center, um, and there are a number of ways that you can do that. And Katie is posting all of those ways in our chat section. Um, and, um, and I hope you're all safe and taking care and thinking about um, furniture and your domestic objects in new ways after this year where you've been confronting them in maybe new ways, <laughs> having to face them all day, every day. Um, looking forward to seeing you all soon. Be safe. <laughs>